I have selected 
information so if you want to know all of it uh, just hit the internet you can read and read and read okay but like I said I wanted to keep mine kind of you know condensed so Yoron did a number of interviews and one of the biggest interviews he did was on Fox it was March 26th and this was a, a three-day special on TV and here is how he explained the situation during that broadcast so he said that Natalie wanted to have sex with him but that he would not do it because he did not have a condom she wanted to stay at the beach but he had school the next day so he could not stay he was picked up at 3 a.m. by one of the Galpo brothers and he left her at the beach and he said that he never told this story because he felt so ashamed to have left a girl at the beach in the middle of the night so that was his story now remember this is just one of multiple stories that he has told regarding this case so I don't know why it's even worth it to interview him and hear what he has to say because clearly he's just making up stories as he goes in April of 2007 Aruba requested that the Netherlands take over the investigation not that they were going to drop out of it completely but they really needed some help because they had found nothing just in case you're not aware Aruba is an independent territory of the Netherlands anyway Joran van der Sloot and the Calpo brothers were arrested again in November of 2007 but due to lack of evidence all of them were released again by December 7th of the same year and at that point they declared that the case was officially closed the problem really was they had zero evidence to, to really prosecute anyone with they had no body they had no real witnesses they just had nothing so even though it seemed like everyone knew what probably happened that wasn't enough in February of 2008 a Dutch crime show showed footage of hidden cameras and microphones from a time when Joran was in the car with a Dutch businessman, businessman slash ex-con he had been smoking marijuana and he clearly told the guy that the night when Natalie went missing he was with her at the beach she started convulsing and she became unresponsive he didn't know what to do so he called a friend the friend told him to go home and then the friend came and disposed of her body so of course after seeing this the authorities went back to him again and said okay what's the story now and he said uh, okay when I said that I was just saying what he wanted to hear and I was high so I didn't mean it and it's not true I left her at the beach and she was fine once again he was interviewed on Fox in November of 2008 this time he said that he sold her into slavery and that is what happened to her somebody gave him money and he handed her over and that is the story
when he was questioned about this, he retracted it and said that it's not true. Now, to make matters even worse, after coming out with lie upon lie upon lie, in March of 2010, Yoron contacted Natalie's mother's lawyer. So, Beth's regarding where you can find Natalie's body if you give me $250,000. So, they immediately told the FBI who got involved. And they went ahead and wired him, I believe, $15,000. That was like a down payment kind of a thing. from him. He said her body was at a certain house, like in the foundation or something. But the thing is, that house did not exist at the time that she went missing. So, it's another lie. And it's extortion. So, on June 30th of 2010, he was indicted on extortion and wire fraud charges in the U.S., in Alabama specifically. But something else happened prior to the indictment on May 30th, 2010, which was exactly five years after Natalie's disappearance. Another woman went missing in Lima, Peru. She was 21-year-old Stephanie Flores. She was a business student. And after three days of looking, they found her body in a hotel room registered to Joran van der Sloot. He ultimately confessed this crime, and he explained that the reason he killed her was because he caught her looking through his laptop, and she found information linking him to Natalie, so he lost his temper. He was sentenced to years in prison for first degree murder to be served in Peru and after finishing that sentence he was to be extradited to Alabama to deal with the extortion charge and he also made a statement regarding the extortion plot. He said that he only did it because he wanted to get back at Natalie's family because they had been making his life very hard over the last five years. Anyway, he went to prison and I guess it wasn't too rough there for him because he was able to use a cell phone, play online poker, have hookups with women who would come visit, and even use drugs. In 2014, he married a woman who he had gotten pregnant. She was six months pregnant when they had their wedding ceremony in prison and she gave birth to a baby girl. Shortly after this, he was moved to a much more strict prison in the Andes. He had threatened to kill the warden at the original prison. So off he went, and his wife explained that he is having a horrible time at the new prison and that he compared it to Guantanamo Bay. In 2012, Natalie's father 
it is, it is extremely, extremely tragic and sad. And of course, to our parents, how do you continue on not knowing what happened to your child?
believe he was there to play poker for a poker tournament. He meets this girl and he kills her. He admitted it, so clearly he did do it. Wouldn't you think he'd say to himself, hey, let's try not to do something too illegal anymore, you know? Let me try not to kill people because it's just not good for my image, you know? Like, all due respect, I'm just saying I can't imagine. Like, obviously he had no self-control. So he, like he said, he lost his temper and he killed her. And then to tell everyone that the reason he lost his temper was because she found information on his laptop about Natalie. Why would he even say that? Seems like he should have said something else. I mean, he's pretty good at lying, so you'd think he could come up with something that doesn't sound as suspicious as that. And then, after all this, they put him in a nice, cushy prison. I don't know if it was nice and cushy, but it sounds like it. I don't want to spread lies, but he was able to do kind of whatever he wanted there. If he was able to get a woman pregnant while he was in prison, and they weren't married at the time that she got pregnant, then that says a lot. So, then he says he's so depressed, it's like Guantanamo Bay. Well, maybe if you stop killing people, you would not have to be there. Alright, I should probably stop, because I'm just rambling now. So anyway, thank you very much for 